Good morning. We have a great panel with us, uh, you know, uh, which spans uh, the business school community, which spans school education, which spans educational administration, liberal arts and design. Uh, I'm going to just raise two or three quick kind of questions. One is we have a new generation of students coming in to our schools and institutions who are more technology, digitally aware and who have for probably also been parented less hierarchically. Um, we have online, which is promise. We also have another challenge, which is the fundamental elitism in Indian education, which I often talk about, which is that the best students get the best teachers. And the worst students, conversely, do not get the best teachers. Is there a way that technology can help us address these issues? I'm just going to uh, request each panelist to offer uh, introductory comments for two minutes, and we'll just go across. Uh, we have a, it's, They've already started the clock, so we have 45 minutes from now. Okay, so uh, two minutes for prefatory comments. Then I will ask provo provocative questions, hopefully, based on some of these comments. And uh, then at the end of it, we will try to, at 40 minutes on this clock, throw it open to the audience for 10 minutes of questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I liked your comment. You said the best students get the best teachers and things like that. I think the best teacher, in today's context, I think the best teacher is experiential learning. Because you know, if we give platforms, if we create platforms for students where they can actually apply the knowledge hands-on, I think experiential learning is going to be the best teacher in the future. Because today's generation is, I think, very energetic, they are very enthusiastic, and they just are not satisfied with classroom learning. I think they need to, we need to break the boundaries of the classroom and we need to uh, move forward and we need to give every child or every young adult who's inside the classroom an opportunity for experiential learning because that's where I think the learning will become more meaningful. Uh, they will imbibe the lessons learned from whatever they have experienced, whatever they have impl ideated and implemented in the, in the field. It could be... Uh, project for the bottom of the pyramid or it could be some technology based project but I think uh, the real teacher today should be experiential learning. Okay, thank you um, and I must compliment again um, this entire uh, you know panelists here to come here and talk about it because I think over uh, three decades of higher education that I've been in I've seen very little change happening because I, and I always used to feel that 19th century faculty are teaching 20th century curriculum to the 21st century students. And that continues and the curriculum doesn't change, pedagogies don't change. What is really gonna change? But everything around us is changing. We don't even know the jobs of 2030. We don't even know what we are training our students for. And then we have this very young, active lot of students who have come in who are called the di digital natives. So I'm going to now take on just this one point that she talked about, experiential learning. And just yesterday, we had the visit of Dean Wharton from of Wharton Business School, Dean Garrett. And the point we were making is that now they've gone one step ahead of experiential learning where they are saying, don't just give me experiential learning in the classroom with a case study or with a project. Give me uh, experiential learning that goes beyond and is live. So I think that's what everybody is looking at, capstones. They want live experiential learning. Just yesterday, we've concluded our first intercollegiate competition, and I did see that who taught these people to do the way they did it? 5,000 students on the campus and 12 member team handling it all. And I'm sure, Indira, you've seen it at Flame and all of you have seen it in all your colleges. It's collaborative learning. It's, it's outside the class learning, which is, I think, taking this ahead. So there's, it's exciting times for educators. Let's hope we change with them. At the outset, let me thank, actually I missed uh, 20th November, Priya is here. I was supposed to speak in, in Delhi. So thank you that for inviting me. I think I will take what uh, both my predecessors, they said. I, I think the, the time has come that you have to realize that 
opportunities are there and this new generation is full with the talent. They are also rich with one additional component that the information that in our time, in 80s, which were heavily dependent on the so-called the great professors, now even they can get right now in the fingertips. So now you see the advantage that you are having. Today you are having opportunities. Today you are having information with you. But what you are missing is, as my colleagues have earlier said, that the knowledge that you are getting in business schools particularly, they are based on the experiential learning. That means they're reflecting you that something more you have to do beyond the class. I will take one step beyond that, that the courses and the pedagogy, they have to be created in such a way that from experience in learning, we have to create the projects in such a way that we have to move towards the action learning. When I say action learning, it's not that the uh, expert from the industry is coming and taking a session which complements the alignment between the theoretical and practical part, but pedagogy should be such that small, small activities should be generated in every course so that students can go in a practical field. And this myth which is there that we are having some kind of challenges of the job of the MBAs and other things, don't keep in this mind. If you are well-trained from a business school, if you are having knowledge from the expert who's your teacher, if you are having the experiential learning at the early career, and you have applied it in the classroom, time is waiting for you. It's a digital economy. It's experiential learning. It's action-based learning that you have got in entrepreneurial world, what is waiting for you, and it's a very rosy, yes. Responsibility lies on us. Us means the leaders who are leading the business schools, engineering colleges, the teachers who are teaching, one teacher teaching multiple courses at a time, Please try to understand the constraints of that. So many students through the digital marketing, through the digital media are attending the classes. Are they able to get the chance to speak? Are they able to get the, some kind of solution to the problem? So Indra Parikh is sitting over here, I, and I think she will be able to reflect you how with the new idea she started the flame 10 years back and how today it's giving the result. So I would like to close at this point that the future is very bright. Things are changing, opportunities are there, technology is facilitating, don't have any kind of negative thinking, and our new generation teachers, leaders will make your journey much more comfortable. Thank you. Good morning. <coughs> Thank you for inviting me uh, to be of the distinguished panel. The theme is disruption. The disruption means, uh, uh, has a negative connotation. We have been in education, churning out the same things which has been there for almost a hundred years, which is outdated and obsolete. And I'll respond to Dr. Banerjee's statement, good students get good teachers. The challenge for today is get the worst students and make them into stars. Now that is the challenge, and that is what the liberal education aims at. Have a spirit, ha let the students acquire a spirit of inquiry and be prepared for whatever comes in their life and be preparing for them not for occupation or employability, but preparing them for life. Then 30 years from now, 40 years from now, whatever the jobs, they will be prepared to respond to it. But if we prepare them from a, for a specific job, the job gets outdated and they get lost out. It's very important that they be prepared for learning for life. In this, the two things are very important. One is the focus, focus on identity. And identity means what is our identity, national identity, cultural identity, social identity. So many things are changing all the time. And we are not prepared, focusing on the social aspects of the young person's life. Now, many of them don't even know how to manage relationships or manage social systems. Yesterday I heard a speech somewhere that you ask a young person to come with you on, in the marriage of a family member, and they said, why should we go? What is so important? So when the parent says they won't come, he says, how does it matter if they don't come? The whole focus is that we have lost out on the social systems, we have lost out on relationships, and the education has been focused for employability, and the young child is pressurized right from the time he is in kindergarten 
study, 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 do well, and it is the parent's pride rather than the child's effort in enjoying the learning process. Uh, today's generation do not know how to be still and do self-reflectivity. They are absolutely, if I ask my students in a class, uh, please spend half an hour alone by yourself, they can't. They just come back and say it was scary to be alone with our eyes closed. We, they'd like to do constantly something. So there are certain very many positive aspects of the young generation today. I mean, I like telling that they are eight generation free Indians, but they must know about what is the Indian heritage. If they do not know, how will they feel proud of themselves? What are they going to be proud of? They need to be proud of their heritage, they need to be proud of their society, they need to be proud of their culture, and only experiential learning can do that, not necessarily just the knowledge-based learning. And our culture has so much heritage of performing arts. We don't even encourage that in families for the children to be engaged in performing arts, or sports, or leadership. Now, because the sports people make tons of money, there is little less restraint on children's playing sports. But I think it needs to be, it has a philosophy. We need to understand the philosophy of education. The child's de development needs to be wholesome and all around multidisciplinary, multicultural, rather than just being preparing them for an occupation which they may give up in no time or they may, that may become obsolete at all. I think already disruption has been created by different views. Well, my own experience, both in terms of academic and industry, disruption is a way of life. We don't have to get scared about it. As I look at it, way back in 1983-84, the profile of students was different than the profile of students of 21st century. The way they look at it is different. Now, it's not just the way that we, they look at it. The most important dynamic that is taking is the market dynamics. How many of us are ready to face the market dynamics, which is changing much more faster than that? Probably a product which was there in existence in way back in the 80s may not exist. But there are certain products which have come back in a different form, in a different shape. What does it mean? That means they understand the market that's changing. If market is changing, one is the management institute or is a technical institute, whichever institute that we are talking about, are we preparing ourselves, our students? The, my own experience that has come, I think we need to understand the profile of the new generation, what we call millennial. And probably when we look at the millennial students, their lifestyles, their expectations are changing. And when their expectations are changing, the most important dimension that is coming up for discussion time and again, is that every time we talk, you complete this assignment, you complete this, there's a placement, there's a pre-placement talk, there's a technology entry. Are we looking into that? Are we going beyond the learning? I think the time has come to go beyond learning. And what I call is as a new concept, which we are trying to experiment on, 80-20 concept. In this 80-20 context, what we are conceptualizing and what we are trying to do it is we retain 80 percent as ma'am rightly said ma'am we are moving towards 20 percent on experimental basis what does it mean every week i'm giving my students just half a day you relax you enjoy the way you want to do it you are liking for music just go and do it you want something for literature do it point here is we are not giving an opportunity for a student but simultaneously when we look at the Teachers, I think the time has come for educating the educators. Educators need to be a friend. Educator cannot be a teacher who goes in a classroom and says, do, do this, 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 this. I don't think. And the last element is, I think students are tired of PPTs. I think the time has come to move away from PPTs than to interactive session where I call, can we move towards examination level, examination no examination and move toward evaluation which is more based on interactive rather than classroom. Thank you. Thank you for having me on this panel. I feel very honored to be with those who are with the institutions of higher learning because for the last 25 years I have worked with young children in schools. And I would say that in order to disrupt the norms, we have to start very young and have a paradigm shift in schools. 
Once upon a time, we used to look at Ken Robinson's video where they said schools kill creativity. And I once thought that that was a very radical viewpoint. But with all due respect to Sir Ken Robinson, I completely disagree with him now because I don't think schools kill creativity. I think the kind of schools that we have today with the paradigm shift that has happened, creativity and opening up young minds is certainly happening at least in our city and our country. The way to do this really is a threefold approach and we work with parents, teachers and students and all of them are stakeholders in the education of the millennials of tomorrow and we definitely need to have them. So having looked at the fact that we live in a generation where information is available at the click of a button, yes, knowledge is important and information is important. But our schools are moving towards a paradigm shift and now we're teaching for conceptual understanding. So what this means is we teach concepts which are, universal, which are universal and transferable. So we no longer talk about a situation in the country, but we talk about migration or we talk about a crisis, and how this holds good through time, place and situation. So if concepts are transferable, we need to teach skills as well. And we talk about the great 21st century skills. I don't think we have a number for this, but if students can learn to be resilient and learn to look after their own lives, I think that would be the one skill that would see them through and help them be prepared for a world that we do not know that exists. The Board of Education does not matter. I'm presently in an international baccalaureate school. One of the best lessons I have ever seen was from a fourth grade teacher in a municipal school. And how did that change? The teacher was supported and she was given the know-how. And when you talk about changing teachers' mindsets, it is absolutely possible. The last economist has a special report on childhood. And it's a very extensive report on how childhood has changed. Once upon a time, the radio and the television were seen as a disruption in being a technological device that would change family relationships. Today, believe it or not, the TV is a family intervention. So similarly, the technology that is moving ahead may be seen as a disruption today. It will become the norm tomorrow and we need to build on it because education is about relationships and technology is only a tool. Thank you. We have uh, two speakers who have joined the panel. In the, so I'll just rebrief. We are looking at the young generation that is joining uh, education today, the, the current generation of students, and how education needs to, be, needs to change. We've had a variety of different perspectives. So uh, Rajneesh, is that right? Uh, Raman from Raman, SIP, Raman, yeah, Raman. So uh, you, you can pick that up and I will hand it over to you after that. So just do a brief introduction yeah. and get into the topic. Yeah, um, I am Dr. Raman, uh, Director of uh, Symbiosis Institute of Business Management, Pune, and the Dean of uh, uh, Faculty of Management of Symbiosis International University. A uh, couple of things which I would like to point out here is the attention span of students is uh, very less. You do not have the same attention span that uh, students had, say, 10, 15 years back. Even if they are on their device, they constantly keep shifting from one to other. The second is the uh, want to win. There is nothing called accepting failure. This is the second thing which, which, with respect to the current generation. And uh, as a society as well, that we do not accept if someone is failing. If there is something wrong, you cannot fail. But when they hit the, uh, the uh, you know, they join the industry, failure is part and parcel of life. So is our education system accepting that failure? The answer is no. So these are two main things which I would like to go and uh, uh, I mean, put in front of this panel. One is the attention span. The second is uh, the acceptance for failure. So if you look at uh, contrary to this, all of them, many of them are hooked onto their devices. PUBG is one which is very famous today. Everyone is playing the game. And uh, mobile gaming is also something which is common. Failing in the game is accepted but not failing in an examination. OK, if I fail in the game, I play it again. So I think there should be a radical change in which education is imparted. It is gamification. So gamification where they learn, where in place of notes, you got a ready-made user content manual where they click, they understand. And in place of exams, they, they try to solve something and they get the star points as it happens in a mobile game. 
I think that's the way to go and change, uh, uh, to make. In fact, we are planning for something on the same lines, that one subject will be completely gamified. In fact, you conduct a lot with respect to simulations. So simulations and gamification is the way in which the entire uh, imparting of uh, knowledge courses should happen. That, that's uh, something from my side. Thank you all. I've in fact, disruption in higher education is a, is a topic that's very, very close to my heart. And uh, uh, I personally feel that you know, most of the disruptions are emerging somewhere from the academia in the sense that all the research that takes place, it is somewhere connected to the academia. But what happens is academia is the last to pick it up and last to implement it. So when the internet came and when the technology came, the, uh, every 20, 30 years, there is a change in technology. But by the time the education system geared up for all the technology, it was 20 years ahead, 20 years ahead and then the entire world is pick, uh, gearing itself up for the next technological revolution and we are still gearing up for the previous technological revolution. So there is a basic problem here with the education system that it accepts the change that happens in the technology in the outside world very slowly. And the systems change, but books don't change. Books change, but lectures don't change. Lectures change, but examination patterns don't change. So all this change, it takes place, it takes place in such a long time that you are ready to move on to the next generation by the time you are. So there's a definite huge lag in the education system, picking up the advances in technology and the environment. This is the most important thing that we need to cater to. We need the education system to be so adaptive to the changes in the environment that it can pick up changes fast. Now the world is very dynamic. And as very rightly said, not only the world's, not only the students' attention span has changed. Everything, everything in the world is changing very fast. We are changing in a very, very dynamic world. And the technologies are changing. Content is changing. Everything is changing. Somebody said that, uh, uh, you know, it is again a very um, uh, controversial kind of thing that the, the electronic content, is it action-oriented or is it just content-oriented? But most of the students who are too much hooked on to the content straight from the internet, they live in a virtual world, very much unconnected to reality. And when they have to work on the shop floor, when they have to face the real problems of life, then all that that has been demonstrated to them on the internet, it doesn't help them much. And because they get a false sense of security from the digital content. So there also, something very hands-on, something which is very, very real to the world, not only virtual, is required as a part of learning process. I will tell you our own experiences. We got the best uh, state award for the startup rankings. And one of the very important reason for that is our student startup policy that we have done. As a part of student startup and innovation policy, we, have, we are now encouraging students across the length and breadth of Gujarat, even in the remotest of the areas, to come up with innovative projects. And the government is funding those innovative projects to the extent of rupees two lakh each so that they can prepare prototypes. So, and they can work on the ideas that their mind is generating. As a result of which, now what has happened? See, the startup Revolution is not confined to Ahmedabad, like it is confined to Bangalore or it is confined to, say, uh, Gurgaon or something like that. But it's not confined to Ahmedabad itself. There is a student group in GEC Mudasa that is inventing, that is uh, 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 generating a patent. In uh, some place at Dahod, which is a tribal area, a patent is getting generated. At some place in Rajkot, a new startup is getting created. You may not even have even heard about those places. And these places don't even have the necessary infrastructure for these students to work on their innovative ideas. We are trying our level best through our uh, facility system to provide, the, uh, to provide the infrastructure to them, to provide support to them. But this is the place where real India lives. And these students have, are really coming up with great ideas. And they have realized that education is not only just 
mugging up the uh, content and re uh, uh, reproducing it or retrieving it at the time of uh, exams. It is also the, as, as um, uh, it was said, experiential learning and also applying that experiential learning creativity, creatively into creating something which is not there. So as I always say, and this of course, it, it doesn't, it's not to my credit, but uh, it, it's to the credit of one of the movies, that imagination is not what, uh, seeing what it is, but imagination is trying to see what is not there. And teaching the students, preparing the students for uh, seeing what is not there is what I think disruptive learning can try to achieve. And that is the time when they can really break the status quo and when they can really check it and say, no, this is something, it's a different way of looking at things. So as, I, as one would always say that one plus one, we are taught that one plus one is equal to two. But tell me, are we taught that one plus one is equal to 11? Now, why? One and one is 11. And one plus one, one and one, why should it only be two? So this is what disruptive uh, uh, thinking, disruptive learning can bring about. And a lot of, uh, uh, lot of in, uh, interventions are being made, but still we need to gear up and still we need to keep pace. The educational system needs to keep pace with the uh, technology. You. Thank you. So uh, I, I think first of all, let me thank my panel because we've had eight panelists speak and uh, we've only taken 20 minutes, which is quite, quite remarkable and disciplined. Uh, there are a couple of issues raised and I'm going to throw this open uh, by focusing on one or two issues and then more or less as you, know, as you want to speak, just indicate, pick up the mic and just. Uh, you know, we've talked about experiential learning. I'm very tempted because our institute is doing a lot on many of these things, but I, I'm going to hold my peace. The big problem is that you have experiences, but as they say, knowledge, experience becomes knowledge when you reflect on it. So if anyone from the panel would like to share, how are you deepening the ability to reflect in today's students? I think, uh, so that is I think one experience where if uh, somebody would like to talk about that dimension. I personally have a different view on millennials, whereas I found that if you have the right teachers in the classroom, attention spans are not an issue at all. So how do you cultivate a generation of teachers who can teach in a non-hierarchical way? So I, I have these two questions. These are, these are open kind of to the panel. I, 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 we'll just pass it around. Uh, Dr. Parikh, maybe you want to start off with? Either we have had a teacher-centric education or a student-centric. And there are two models. We, are, we, mean we need to make it learning-centric. Both teacher and the student learns. Because if the teacher doesn't learn, then of course doesn't, is not in touch with the students. And the students need to learn because they need to find the learning exciting and happy to learn. If it is a boredom, you see, the minute the schools are over, high school is over, the worst is how are they going to bunk classes. Now the whole experience of the schooling life, they want to bunk classes, they don't want to go to classes, they calculate how much absenteeism is allowed, and then they would miss those classes. Now, that's not a learning process. They need to say, why should we miss the single class? Because the classes are so interesting. So it's very important, yes, the faculty or the teachers need to be learning, they need to learn also with the new kinds of students. Anything about experiential learning and reflection? Anybody would like to pick that up? Um, I think uh, experiential learning, this is exactly something that we felt was missing when we introduced experiential learning. And when we say experiential learning, there's certain different mm -hmm. kinds of projects that we introduced. One was if there's a master class and if there's a great speaker who's coming in, they be a part of it and they earn their credit through that. Or they go and attend a conference. But we weren't understanding the learning. So now we've created what's called a reflective journal. And the reflective journal, they have to put everything that they are understanding into a reflective journal. Now also the teachers should also have enough reflection to be able to understand the reflective journal with this. So it's quite a challenge, let me tell you. It's not so easy because reflection, as, as Indira said, doesn't come naturally 
to a whole society of uh, learners, excepting if you're really deeply into liberal arts and so on, and, and especially at schooling level, and I'll, I'll pass this on to you. The second thing is, how do you get outliers as teachers, right? We want the teachers to be outliers, thinking differently. And I can tell you, attention span will not be, I'm just gonna give one example and pass this on. Um, we were introducing the software of Adobe. And I was meeting the, the, the chief of Adobe. I met the in India head and the global head. And they said, we've set up an Adobe Academy in the US. I said, you're wasting your time setting up an Adobe Academy in the US. India has got the maximum Adobe followers. It's a, you know the softwares. And spe especially Photoshop. Look how Indians use the Photoshop. I said, and you're putting up an academy there. So in my Facebook, I just wrote, how about an Adobe University? And a young 22-year-old writes to me from Seattle. I'll teach there. I said, who are you? Joshua. Are you an Indian? Yes. I went to school in Mumbai. I said, come back, teach. He came here for a module. He taught one module in the class. The students were chasing him everywhere he went. And he had a 24 into 7 module because he taught in the class and then WhatsApp. Right? That's it. A 22-year-old non-qualified teacher today taught them the technology of the future. Right? That, that's what it is. That's yeah. You want? Yeah. I, um, when we talk about experiential learning, we cannot talk about single subject learning. And I think that's where uh, life begins, because life is chaotic, and life is a mess. Life does not end in physics or chemistry alone. And physics and chemistry then gets you know, combined with literature and math and social studies and so on and so forth. So when you talk about experiential learning, we have to move into a transdisciplinary or an interdisciplinary paradigm where we no longer have when the bell rings and the period is over, you switch into another subject. Think about how that happens. Um, I also think that outliers, the best teachers, have been the teachers who, quote, unquote, don't have the qualifications, exactly. right? Exactly. I know. I, I think, in fact, no, PhD. no PhDs, no BEDs. But they're just, op they are the ones who build relationships with the children. And when you talk about inquiry, you throw the content into the children. Believe you me, five-year-olds will give you better questions than any PhD hypothesis could ever give you. And if you're able to build on that in an interdisciplinary way, I think that's where we can just fly without having to worry about the confines of the subject. So great. I think, I think the diversity on the panel is really kicking in. So we'll have Monica and then Dr. Konda, and then I'll, I'll pick it up and take it. First. OK, I'll really uh, add to what both of you have said. I, we have, uh, I'd like to narrate what we are doing on our campus with our business school students. Uh, we have started an initiative called as the Ankur Experiential Learning Initiative. We have a, a vernacular, a Gujarati medium school on our campus and uh, the uh, registrations in that school, the children all come from the uh, local slums uh, near the campus and they're from the bottom of the pyramid. So what our students uh, do, our management students do is every Friday afternoon on a voluntary basis, uh, our students go and teach conversational and written English to these children. It's a Gujarati medium school. Now what happens is that every week, uh, every Friday afternoon, these students go there and uh, you know they converse with these students and they teach them all of this. Now what's happening is our student is not only teaching them but is also learning from where these children are coming. You know, And uh, in fact, the ch our students also go to the slums from where these kids come and they try and understand the psychosocial space of these children. Now what's happened is the impact has been very great on both the teacher and the taught. Now our students, they write a page, they reflect on what they have learned by teaching these bottom of the pyramid children. And these children, they look upon our students as their mentors. And even after our students have passed out from the institute, these bottom of the pyramid kids are still you know, in connection with our uh, business school students. In fact, last year for the first time, we also had something called as a, a sort of a lunch party for these children. 
our mess caterer, he gave the lunch for free to all these children. And these children they came on the stage and they made a small speech, like you know, introducing themselves in English and things like that. So I thought that was a very great initiative where you know the learning was not, it was not just about teaching English. But I think it was learning a lot more and learning was both ways, you know. And it is interdisciplinary, as you said. They learned about the child psychology, they learned about the psychosocial space of the, of the bottom of the pyramid kids. And there's a deep appreciation that management is not just technology and within the confines of a business school. There's huge amount of management or the country needs professional management in various uh, spheres. So I think that's a, uh, that's a way I think we should be taking uh, education or business management education forward. So uh, thank you, Monica. I think Dr. Konda, Dr. Raman, uh, keep it brief, sir, I'll come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Keep it brief. I just want to add one because thing. We, we do want to give some time to the audience. Yeah. What yeah, I'm looking back. at is the application-based learning. Hmm. The most important dimension that we added is ask the students to perform work on experimental basis. It's no longer get into the classroom, we teach, we do, we, we teach, we teach. We said no question of teaching. You better go to the marketplace, understand market realities, work, do the experiments. Maybe you're wrong. We took simple examples like people talked about how do we talk of positioning and I said no nonsense. We'll, I'll not teach you Kotler. I said you go there, understand yourself, how you position yourself and start comparing yourself. What has happened is that has changed the entire mindset of the student. They think, oh, it's possible. I said, it's possible. I give us, as you rightly said, education is not. I just took them to a vendor. I said, look at the fruits that he has arranged. The guy was very clear. The best fruit are kept in front. Next quality, next quality. What does it mean? Oh, I said, this is the concept that we are talking about. So most important for all of us, can we move towards application or experiential learning, wherein the students of next generation move towards it. And added to that, we only added new dimension, what we call Natya Shastra and Mindful Communication. So thank These you, are the two important things. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dr. Raman, uh, then yeah. Uh, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I spoke about attention span, mm. and uh, there are some who do not agree. The number of times we checked our email 15 years back and the number of times we check our email today is drastically different and that's for sure for millennials as well. So when you talk about an attention span, gone are the days when you sit in a classroom for 90 minutes and listen to the prof alone. In between your phone comes up, you check what's happening, you pass on some comments on WhatsApp, there is some other discussion. That this is where I'm talking about an attention span. So this aspect has to be considered in the classroom. And if it is considered, the classroom can become very effective. Just for the benefit of all, there is a tool called Kahoot. Some of you might be knowing it, some of you might not. This is an open source tool which can help you go and take up questions and immediately ask the students to pull out their phones and give the answers. It becomes a game. Their name is there on the projector along with what is the answer that they gave. Who gave first, the fastest fingers first, is also displayed. So it becomes a game and it becomes an evaluation plus the non-value-add activity called attendance, attendance taking is gone because the student has already put up his number and given an answer, so that becomes attendance. So this is exactly what I'm telling, that since we know that their attention span is limited, after about 30 minutes, can we pull up a Kahoot quiz, make them take their mobile, give the answer, attendance is done, something destruction is already done, and then you continue. Okay. Even if you're going to have a very good prof who's going to stand there, because of the nature that right from their class 10, they've been using their mobiles. So they want some kind of distraction Going to a temple or a church or a mosque, also mobile goes with you. Going to the toilet, go, mobile goes with you. So the kind of distraction that the students have is much higher. And hence, that aspect has to be considered when a prof gets into a class or a teacher gets into a class. Okay, so uh, I think you made your point. Uh, just a quick point, we find various types of professors. There are people who use apps like Poll Everywhere. There are people who say, this is a mobile phone table. Keep your t mobiles on that table. As long as the professor can hold the attention, we don't find it's a big issue. Sir, you had a point. I just wanted to say something. It's about the system. We have practical experience of experiential learning. We are having 25 full-time faculty and 36 experiential learning visiting faculty. And as Professor Parikh said, that some of the professors who are from the department, they are as popular as the experiential learning professors. And some of the experiential learning professors, they are also not so effective as we are. What is the most important is 
if you are flexible and adaptable to the new pedagogy and you are treating your students that look our goal is not only to impart the knowledge but to change their mindset you see you are now having not the race of cases every course is having simulation based every professor is a free so what is needed is now the education systems have to keep their eyes open and they should be in position to apply all kinds of experiments experiential learning knowledge cannot be compromised if students are free to come in the class or they are not free to come in the class don't worry about them they are going to come to you and therefore if you are able to take this particular mantra in the background i think students are going to come to your class not the 100% they could be 66.6% you should bother about them and rest is in your hands okay uh, dr bhagav we will have to move on dr parik and then anju uh, and I then I'll, I'll just throw one it to statement the to make experiential learning is expression with heart mind and action mm. right that is if and it is anchored in their identity if it is with self worth a student will do the best okay, i'd like to make a point no and you had a point and no, I just a very quick point that I wanted to make was that uh, we're talking about students most of the time, experiential learning for them, but the teachers who are teaching them, they also need experiential learning first because they have come from a system that did not offer them experiential learning. And that is why uh, they are not actually prepared to impart, prepared in the sense that uh, actually uh, 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 fit to impart experiential learning to students. So first we have to focus a lot on the teachers to give them the experience and only then they can impart that experience to the students. Okay. Monica, a quick point and... Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd like to make a quick point here that, you know, I think uh, for experiential learning, a lot of unlearning needs to be done by our students because they've come through a system of school where rote learning, tuition classes and the race for getting marks is so bad that, you know, I mean, I mean, it comes as a shock for them that they have to do self-learning also, or there is something called as experiential learning. So I think if changes have to be done, it has to be done at the school level because this race for marks is crazy. And I think it's really killing some of our students. And if you read about suicides and things like that, and mental breakdowns among the student community, I think it's the rote learning and the race for marks that's responsible. Okay, so um, I, I'll have to one point that she talked about teacher training and, and teacher. I just have one thing to say. We started something called Teacher Within Industry, TWI, when you're talking about experiential. The teacher must spend one month in a year within industry in the, next, in the three year period. And that's where they learn 